friends uh, we are starting now today is 192nd friday group meeting the topic is constitution of india principles of interpretation the speaker is our beloved senior advocate mr ramakrishnan veera raghavan and also uh, senior advocate and barrister also uh, we met recently sir he immediately expressed his willingness to address our this thing so uh, before uh, Uh, sir starts i request rahul sharma will say few words about sir good afternoon everyone i feel deeply honored to be given this opportunity to introduce our distinguished speaker barrister and senior advocate ramakrishnan veera raghavan sir to the audience Sir is a barrister at law in a temple and has a diploma in international arbitration CR fellow of the Chartered Institute, Institute of Arbitrators London LLM in international commercial law and practice from University of Edinburgh diploma in ADR from Nalsa Nal University LLB from University of Bangalore and BCom from University of Madras Sir has a practice of 37 years in India and in London Early in his career, sir has appeared in matters of Income Tax Act, Sales Tax Act, and before the Income Tax Appellate Tribunal and Sales Tax uh, Tribunal. He has specialized knowledge in accounts, accounting standards, and corporate financial statements, aided by his BCom and experience in experience with corporate matters and directorship in listed companies. He is also specialized in taxation. Studied <laughs> principles of international taxation in his LLM at the University of Edinburgh. He is currently writing a commentary on the law of goods and services tax, which will be published in 2023. He has lectured in an ongoing e-lecture series for of officers posted at AR offices, CES TAT, and field offices of CBIC. Sir has ample experience in IBC and commercial litigation, appearing as senior counsel before the Supreme Court, the National Company Law Tribunal, and National Company Law Appellate Tribunal, prosecuting and defending matters in, under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court for the petitioner, petitioning creditors, corporate debtors, and resolution professional in resolu resolution plans, avoidance applications. Surcharge proceedings, uh, corporate liquidation, company petitions for operation and mismanagement under Companies Act. Notably, he has appeared in uh, reorganisation relating to more than 300 companies, advised and appeared in matters of IPOs, buybacks, SEBI, and stock exchange related issues. Sir is also experienced in uh, practicing in the field of international and domestic arbitration. He has instructed in a large number of arbitration, both domestic and international, <coughs> at uh, the Hague, and in, in infrastructural arbitration, including the affluent treatment projects, desolation, material project arbitration for a government company, and in international joint venture arbitration. Instructed in the Supreme Court and in High Court, challenging or upholding domestic and international commercial arbitration awards. Sir has also been appointed by the Singapore International Arbitration Centre (SIAC) and cur currently serving as an arbitrator in a panel of three arbitrators in shareholder dispute valued at about 10 100 uh, million US dollars between disputant based in Mauritius and in India. In addition, sir has drafted a large number of rules, including the writ rules, video conference rules, and the arbitration rules as a member of the drafting subcommittee. Sir has also a number of publications to his credit. Some of his publications include Madras High Court Letter Patent, Appellate and Original Side Rule 6 Edition 2015, published by Lexis Nexis. The other one is Guide to International Laws, published by Global X, New York University School of Law. With this introduction, I would like to request Sir to kindly address us.
thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, I'd like to share my impressions about the Friday group. Now, many years ago, uh, Sri Shri Rao Garu had started this, and uh, I told him that this is a perfectly Gandhian principle, Mahatma Gandhi, also an inner temple barrister. He said, be the change you want to see in the world. So he found inadequacies in the system and he has mentored this program. Now, earlier on, many times I've heard of this program, but uh, I was practicing earlier in the Madras High Court. And you know, Friday morning we come here, we live or we die and then we go back to catch the flight. So I never had the chance to participate in this group. Uh, then, uh, of course, when this online came over, I watched several programs online. And here, I had the privilege of attending a couple of uh, sessions. And then this very grand book launch, I had the privilege. The other thing was, after that, I tried to attend a couple of uh, Friday group meetings. I came late. There was no place here. So my suggestion is, in view of the popularity, you might think of a Friday group conference hall also in future. <laughs> Probably even in a Friday group auditorium. That's the kind of popularity you have. And now on this constitution, interpretation of the constitution, uh, hugely complex. Statutory interpretation is complex. Interpretation of constitution, largest uh, constitution in the world, perhaps. Too much, you know. I don't know how many of you fared well in your statutory interpretation in the LLB. Very difficult paper. So, what I thought was, let's have a slightly different, less complicated, simple approach to statutory interpretation. And then I tested this out in the book which I wrote. Here I had a chapter on constitutional interpretation of GST laws and uh, interpretation of statutes. Then I did the next step, first wrote the book, then I, I participated in this uh, National Conference for High Court Judges on Development of Constitutional Law at Bhopal. So I lectured to the High Court Judges on this particular uh, new approach to interpretation. I had a good review from the High Court judges. So I'm sharing this new approach uh, with you. Now, the new approach is this. Uh, let's start at the very basics. Why is the human species, all of us, why are we the successful, most successful animals in the planet? I mean, we form a part of the animal kingdom. That can be undisputed. But why are we so successful? Elephants, uh, great apes, they are stronger, so much better, so much evolved for the environment. We are weak, basically. Why have we succeeded? Now, there are many theories of it. And one of the theories of our success as a species is communication. Now, if you take uh, groups of animals, a herd of elephants, you can't have more than 50 members in that herd. More than 50, they branch out to become a new herd. Similarly, great apes, similarly, you know, uh, fishes also. You might have 2,000 fish in a school. More than that, they form another school. Why is that? Because more than 50 elephants, more than 2,000 fish, they can't communicate with the individuals. So, they have another group where there is another leader and they start communicating with each other. You cannot guide, say, 20,000 uh, fish or 300 elephants in a particular group. But we are so good at communication. Take this meeting, for instance. I have not met any of you closely apart from a few. But I am able to communicate to you. We are able to come to an understanding and we are able to carry this understanding to our officers and implement them. Uh, this is the secret of <coughs> success of the human species. Now, I would like you to translate this to statutes of parliament and the constitution of India. I want you to look at constitution of India as nothing more than a communication by the constituent assembly to the people of India. Forget statutory interpretation, complications, all that. Think of this as a communication by the Constituent Assembly to the people. This is what we have given you. This is our communication. And how do you understand that communication? is constitutional interpretation. As simple as that. Then let's find out what is essential for communication. Three things. 
essential for communication. Number one, we must speak the same language. Now, if I speak in English and you try to understand it in Hindi, we are in a problem. Because some words, for instance, cheese, I say cheese and you understand cheese in Hindi, not in English, then we have a problem. So you understand, speak in the same language. Second thing is understand the meaning of the words in the same language. Third thing, understand the same grammar of the language. You might understand the language. If you apply uh, English grammar to Hindi, you can't understand. The difference between an ordinary communication like what we are doing now and the constitution of India, three differences. Number one, if the people of India do not understand the constitution, they cannot go back to the constituent assembly and say, look, I don't understand, can you please explain? They have to go to the court. The court acts as a dubashi, the court act acts as an interpreter. If there is some difference in the interpretation of the constitution, some difference in understanding, then the people of India will go to the court to see, look, we don't understand this, we understand it this way, this is it. And we cannot approach, it cannot be a dialogue directly. The dialogue should be rooted to the court. And let us say the court interprets it in a manner which the parliament does not agree. Then what does the parliament do? The parliament amends. The recent uh, reservation bill uh, and the amendments to the reservation is an example. The Supreme Court interpreted that as giving primacy to the <coughs> union on who should be in the reservation list. The parliament disagreed and they have amended the constitution. That is the communication. <coughs> so let's start with the grammar. Now each, each language has a different grammar. Rules of grammar are different. Rules of grammar are for... Rules of grammar for the constitution of India is the rules of statutory interpretation. That takes the place of rules of grammar. And the language is, of course, English, but the language is a formal language and it is a legal language, both written in legal language and interpreted according to rules of grammar, namely statutory interpretation. <coughs> but the problem here is, both rules of grammar and the language must be equally understood by the parliamentary draftsman and by the court in the same way. The draftsman, parliamentary draftsman cannot understand it in a different language, different way and then the courts understand it in a different way, there will be confusion and chaos. This is why it is very important to have standardized rules of statutory interpretation. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Now, First, we must analyze what we are interpreting. We are interpreting the constitution of India, but it is very important to understand that the constitution of India is not a legal document. It is never a legal document. It is, it is a socio-political economic document written in legal language. It is not a legal document. It is Why I am saying it is not a legal document is because we are breaking away from the English parliament and we have not formed our own parliament to give us laws. In the intermediate stage you had the constituent assembly. Not all constitutions are like ours. Now the, thank you, the American constitution again is similar to ours, a revolutionary constitution, it was a political document. But two constitutions, the Canadian constitution and the Australian constitution, they are not political documents, they are legal documents. And why they are legal documents is because the constitution of Canada and the constitution of Australia, they were enacted by the British parliament. They enacted the parliament, uh, gave the act to these nations and they chose to make it their own constitution. But for us, the only legal document was the India Independence Act. But the constitution came after that and that is our own document, not a legal document. It is a political document designed to give utmost freedom to every person in India and prospects of increase in wealth, discrimination to be removed. These are the political and socio-economic 
uh, goals of the constitution. They were not legal goals. The legal issues derived from the constitution. Now let's go to the purpose of interpretation of the constitution. Now the purpose of any communication is to understand what the speaker is saying. So the purpose of constitutional interpretation is to understand the intention of the constituent assembly. Fair enough. But what is the intention of the constituent assembly is something we have to explore a little more. Now, intention of the speaker is very often a question of fact. In criminal law, we call it mens rea. So that's a question of fact. Does, does he have that guilty intent? Is If someone says, I want to kill, and then that's an indication of the mens rea. Now, in contracts, it comes differently. Uh, is there fraud? Is there an intention to defraud? These are all intentions which are questions of fact. But in the interpretation of a constitution or interpretation of a statute, the intention is a question of law. It is never a question of fact. Intention of the constituent assembly means it's a short, shortened term to say what does the constituent assembly mean by what they have said. It is a shortcut for saying a linguistic convenience to say what is the meaning of the words written in the constitution. When you say intention of parliament, what is the meaning of the words enacted by the parliament. So this is how we must view constitutional interpretation. The first principle here is intention of the constituent assembly is a question of law therefore it is not the intention of the members of the constituent assembly now the constituent assembly had about 301 members i think and it varied some of them passed away some of, then the uh, lot of them went over to pakistan and became members of the pakistan constituent assembly so the numbers were fluctuating now, if you want to interpret the constitution through the speeches made in the floor of the constituent assembly, whose speech will you take? Not all the members spoke and some of them who spoke disagreed with the others who spoke. So you don't know what it is. And thirdly, there were a large silent majority who voted the constitution and you don't know why they voted. Did they agree with A speaker or B speaker or did they agree, disagree with both of them and vote? So to find out the intention of the constituent assembly from speeches of uh, individual members that is like uh, avoiding the substance and chasing shadows. We should not do that. The second reason, this is a reason in principle. The second reason is intention is given as I said by the text of the constitution. How do you go behind the text and say, no, no, the constituent assembly has written this in the constitution, but they have said something else in the speech. So I ignore what they have written and go to the speeches. That again is wrong in principle. Then the third reason why you should not go to the speeches of the constituent assembly is, I mean, not a single member is alive today. And this constitution is meant not only for our generation, but for future generation. Let's say another 50 years from now, our republic is 120, 130 years and more. How can you allow the dead to control the hands of the living? You cannot do that. New developments may take place in the last next couple of 50 years. Which the For instance, which constituent assembly member thought article 14 will include the right of privacy they wouldn't have the right of privacy was completely undeveloped world over in 1950s 1950 the crisis was mouths to feed poverty was a crisis not privacy privacy is a luxury for developed countries we are now entering that phase and <coughs> so generic interpretation can, will be stopped if you think constituent assembly members will be allowed to interpret the constitution. So, when you discard, when you discard the speeches of the constituent assembly members, then you are left with the first rule of interpretation of any communication. Somebody speaks to you, 
then what do you do? You listen to the words first. If somebody tells you something, you understand what he is saying from the words that he is used. You don't go behind the intention. You first listen to the words. So the first rule for interpretation of the constitution is look at the text. Textual interpretation of the constitution is the first and possibly the best rule. It is called the golden rule. <coughs> Understand the words written in the constitution by normal usage of the meaning of the words using plain English grammar. This is the golden word. Now, if you take this, then it splits into two schools. Number one, let's say there is some word used in the constitution. I'm using randomly a word in one of those lists saying telegraph. Should you interpret telegraph as the meaning of telegraph in 1950 or should you come to today's interpretation? Now, persons, American constitution particularly, they say you must interpret the constitution according to the words having the meaning at the time of the constitution's writing not now. Now, that interpretation is suitable for the American constitution because American constitution runs to about five, six pages. I don't know if you have seen it. It's a small booklet. You can put it in your pocket and take it away. American constitution has been interpreted by the American Supreme Court as saying it is not a building. It is the pillar foundation for a building. That is all. You can build anything you want, but only the foundations are there. Now, if it is a bare body foundation, bones, nothing more, then you can probably go into the original intent. But in a constitution like ours, one of the most complex constitutions here, it has covered everything. It's not just bones, it's a built up building. Then you must, prob and second, we are a developing nation, a young nation. America is 200 years old plus. So, here we cannot take the original intent. We must go to the intention, the meaning of the words as they are now. So let's say telegraph. Telegraph is now gone. Uh, I think the next generation won't even know the meaning of telegraph. Uh, I remember in my younger days, the court will say issue by telegram. So we will rush to the telegraph office and then make sure it goes by telegram. All that is now gone. So. We must include telegraph in a broad manner to include mobile phones and whatever other forms of communication which comes here now. So this is another interpretation. Take the text, number one, plain grammar meaning, but look at the meaning as it goes on. Don't be stuck in 1950. Look at the meaning at 2023. Look at the meaning at 2050 when a nation reaches that stage. So that's the first rule of interpretation. The second rule of interpretation is context. The same words in a different context has a completely different meaning. Uh, for example, uh, let's say you have won a great case. You come out in the corridor and said, I've killed the other side. You're very, very happy. Uh, different context. Middle of the night, someone comes with a bloody hand and knocks your door and said, I've killed him with a knife. Then that killed him as a completely different the kill. You look at the dictionary, it's the same meaning. But in the corridor saying I've killed the other side is completely different from a midnight bloody knife with a... Uh, that's a different thing. So, interpretation, same word, same meaning, same context, same grammar, everything. But the context changes, the entire interpretation changes. So you start with the context in which the word is used in the constitution. When you have some word, you have some sentence. You don't look at that sentence and the word. You look at the context in which it is placed. And the rule of context is, context moves from the inside to the outside. Uh, for example, you take any particular article. You take a word in an article. Then you have the sub-article. For instance, 179, you have you start with 179 sub-article. Then you have this clause in the article. So, 
context moves from the clause sub clause clause sub article article then the article has a context of the part in which the chapter and the chapter is in the part and the part is in the context of the entire constitution so you move from inside to outside second thing is preamble preamble has been said to be the window to the constitution so the preamble is also a part of the constitution it's a part of the context it does not control the constitution the rest of it but it's a part of it the second thing is the constitution itself article 366 has definitions of words used in the constitution then 367 has rules for interpretation of the constitution so three things when you are interpreting the constitution number 1 as i said textual interpretation take the words number 2 words must be in the context number 3 look at what the constitution itself says does it have a definition does it have rules of interpretation does that fit in all these things are a part of what is called the internal context internal laws of interpretation of any statute or uh, con- constitution for instance then you have what is called external aid for interpretation external aid is where you look at the constitution from outside the constitution this external aid one of the most important external aids for interpretation of the indian constitution is of course the constitution assembly debates but pausing here for a moment i don't know how many of you have actually seen what a marginal note is the marginal note we say is always used for interpretation of statutes constitution now look at the marginal note here i am taking article say 200 and uh, randomly i am taking article okay let's say article number 14 which you are all very very familiar equality before law now equality before law is given here it is not a marginal note it is a heading but that is completely wrong now i have taken a print out of the original constitution it's a handwritten constitution as you know look at the marginal note the marginal note is in the margin now marginal note let's say you have your slp paper books and when you have your slp paper books you come across a nice point you take your pen and write it in the margin <coughs> that is the marginal note now unfortunately what has happened is if you write a marginal note here and put it like this printing costs go up this book will be at least 30% bulkier and 30% more pages will be spent and 30% publishers profits will go down so not one publisher in india has ever printed a marginal note like a marginal note they have all printed it like a heading and what we are now doing is we are thinking this is a heading and we are using it as a heading to interpret the rest of it heading is very important marginal note is a note in the margin it is only meant for guidance now what i have done is in this book of mine gst law as you know is very very complex i didn't want to add to the complexity so here i give you another uh, example now for instance this is section 90 of the gst laws i don't know if you can see it i insisted that the publisher to write a marginal note like this this is one of the few acts where you have the marginal note like this so when you look at this marginal note you know it is not very important it is only in the margin it is only an aid to interpretation it does not control the section but if it's a heading it will control the section so when you are interpreting the constitution you must please remember that everything written in these constitution acts printed by public private parties are only marginal notes not headings uh, when i was very young the government central government printing and stationery used to print the constitution and bar acts they used to print it with a marginal note because that was anyway subsidized 
Now I find even the government of India, if you download a constitution PDF from the uh, a parliament website, you will have this only as a head note. Now I told this to the high court judges and they were all surprised. Nobody knew what a marginal note was. But please bear in mind, this is a marginal note. It is not as important as a heading for interpretation of the constitution. Uh, then I come to the words, interpretation of the words. There are two rules, again, in the context. Uh, one rule is nosita e soshi is, and the second is ISDM generis. The common thing for both these words, rules are birds of a feather flock together. You will remember that. Uh, nosita e soshi is says a word is known by what the words it associates with. One bird is known by the other bird, birds which are around it. For example, if you have to interpret these three words, wood, hammer, nails, let's say they are found in the constitution. Forget that for a minute. Then you have another set of words, powder, lipstick, nails. Nails in the first instance, you will know it's something you hit with a hammer. Nails in the second, you know it's something you will use your polish on. Because nails in the first, wood, hammer, nails. Second, powder, lipstick, nails. So this is the meaning of the word, uh, the rule, nositere soshi is. A person is known by the company, he keeps birds of a feather flock together. Then the second one is the rule in ISDM generis. Now, it's a uh, Latin pronunciations are generally traps for people like us. Uh, it is E J U S D E M. It is pronounced I S D M generis, not you just dumb. I S D M generis. Now again, it says of the same species. Uh, for instance, wood, hammer, nails, and other things. What are the other things? Obviously, carpentry items. When you say wood, hammer, nails and other things, I will not say it covers an aeroplane. No. Similarly, powder, lipstick, nails and other things. Uh, definitely you can't bring carpentry items there. Definitely you can't say uh, law books will form a part of this other things. So this is the second rule. Then I'll come a little more to the context of the constitution and external aids. Now we saw this, uh, <coughs> uh, constituent assembly debates have said, please don't rely on it because it is confusing. And what we are now doing, uh, many judges do this, I have told the judges themselves, so this is not a secret. What they do is, you, you argue a proposition before them, they decide we are going to, dis we are going to interpret it this way. And then they call their law clerks and say, this is my inter go through the constitutional assembly debate, see if there is any speech to support me. So they are putting the cart, instead of cart before the horse, what are they doing? That's it. Instead of using constituent assembly debates as an aid to interpretation, they interpret the constitution according to their own uh, decisions, which is not wrong. But they are using some debate gathered out of the context. And what does his law clerk do? He's a young boy or a girl. He does a verb search, a computer search, and then that word comes in, he lifts that paragraph. So you will have a judgment reserve 20 pages, the Constitutional Assembly debate said this, this, this. Now Sirwai pointed this out in his uh, uh, magnum opus. He said the Supreme Court relied on this speech. And then he went to another speech and said they could have relied on that speech because that speech was exactly the opposite of the first speech. Which speech do you rely on? So my suggestion is don't get into speeches of everybody other than the members of the uh, drafting committee. See, drafting committee is a special committee there and they were people who were something like the ministers who introduced a bill into the parliament. So listen to, go through the minutes of and speeches of drafting come. And the chairman of the drafting company, of course, you, you know who he is. And Dr. Ambedkar's speeches you can rely on. 
because dr ambedkar as a chairman he was responsible for drafting the first the draft of the constitution and that draft he could explain he said look this is what we decided at the and that is useful to find out what is the mischief what did he intend to do that second thing you can use i don't know how many of you know there were about 5 6 drafts of the constitution of india uh, the very first draft was prepared by the constitutional adviser to the constituent assembly uh, sir rov he prepared the first draft and the first draft was the basis of the entire constitution i mean he hasn't been given the credit that he deserves so it is always it is tough but it's relatively easy to prepare on the foundation of a very good draft i'm saying senior council settling a brief much easier when the drafting council has prepared a very good brief but the credit goes to the senior not much to the drafting council in a similar manner the credit has gone to the drafting committee well deserved i'm not saying but some credit must have gone to the constituent so the first draft was there and then what happened the first draft was given to the con- drafting committee and the drafting committee put together there were different committees there was a fundamental rights committee there was a union committee there was a states committee each of them were very very learned people they were advocate generals in their own state and they gave reports then the drafting committee had very eminent reports four or five of them put them all together and then prepared a draft this draft was presented to the constituent assembly and given for public comments public comments came in and look at them they had the humility when the public comments came in the cons- drafting committee did not say look look at the eminence of the committee look at us we are not going to be bothered about we are going ahead no they took back the public comments and redrafted it again so when you are interpreting the constitution instead of wasting time on uh, speeches other than drafting co- sub committee speeches you must go through the first draft you must go through the revised draft and you must go through the re-revised draft what are the changes the changes will tell you the intention more clearly so this is on my uh, we are running out of time 340 yeah, no, 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 so right. please okay. continue so uh, external aid internal aid and the external aid the best thing is drafts of constitution speech of the drafting committee members and lastly the difference in the drafts what is the reason for that one thing you shouldn't do is you shouldn't rely on judgments of foreign courts to support interpretation of our constitution i don't know are you familiar with gobi manchurian <laughs> okay <laughs> gobi manchurian is gobi hindi word manchurian some person from china now if you ask and it's a chinese this in india if you ask any chinese i have asked a couple of my friends what is gobi manchurian they are just just is blinking because you gobi manchurian you order in china you will never get it they will stare at you so what we have done is we have taken gobi we have taken manchurian put everything together and got a something like a chinese dish it is not a chinese dish it's a indian dish with a chinese name similarly don't do it to our constitution <laughs> <laughs> don't take american constitution put it here and say look this is very nice it's a nice flavor no what you should do is you take principles of interpretation um i'll give you an anecdote uh, sir raw went over world over before drafting the f- uh, framework constitution and asking experts now when you look at article 21 he met justice felix frankfurter of the american supreme court and he said how do you do the constitution he said do whatever you want with your indian constitution but please don't use the word proceed uh, due process of law if you use the word due process of law you will make lawyers for five generations very rich that is all you will do don't ever use it because we have used the word due process of law in our constitution and 
the Supreme Court interpreted due process of law in any way they wanted. So we came back and initially Article 21 had the word due process of law, one of the drafts. And now it has been removed. It says except according to the procedure ex by law. So if you are going to rely on uh, due process of law judgments for our constitution, you are back to Govi Manchuria. So be very careful interpreting the constitution using foreign judgments, but foreign judgments on principles of statutory interpretation. That is very useful. You can apply the principle. For example, you can uh, don't use the recipe for the dish, don't use the recipe, but use the ingredients. If you feel there is something there useful for us, tasteful for our constitution, use that. But don't bring it as a part of your recipe and cook it. You you can't do that. It will be a mi mismatch. Okay. Please then, continue, sir. What yeah. Up to you, sir. Now I've stopped with uh, interpretation, principles of interpretation. I'm going to end by saying one of the greatest judgments of our constitutional court did not follow and in fact had broken every single uh, rule for interpretation of a statute. Uh, I'm sure you'll know what the case is. Keshwananda Bharati. Yes, you use the word Keshwananda Bharati, let's look at very, very basics. Seven out of six in favor of basic structure. Have you found the word basic structure? Any law clerk does a PDF search, Google search, whatever, you won't find the word basic structure in the constitution. I'm not sure if you'll even find the word structure. Now, then look at the uh, judges. About Out of the seven judges, five judges use similar words. I think Justice uh, Mukherjee, he said, uh, Justice Khanna, basic structure, basic elements, fundamental feature. Justice Hegde and Mukherjee, they said, basic elements, fundamental features. Justice Jagan Mogan Reddy, fundamental rights or other essential elements of the basic structure. Then uh, each of these judges used different words and they couldn't even agree on what basic structure is. I will give you a contrast. <coughs> I was lecturing to Indian constitutional law to Bangladesh judges and they gave me the Bangladesh constitution. Seven, Article 7b of the Bangladesh constitution, notwithstanding anything contained in so and so and so and so, all the provisions of the articles relating to basic structure of the constitution including so and so article shall not be amenable by way of insertion modification, substitution, repeal or by any other means. The, this constitution defines basic structure. It says so and so, so and so articles are basic structure and says it cannot be amended. Now, uh, what about our constitution? No. And then look at the history of basic structure. It all started with article 13. How much time? Just, just yeah, please, sir, please <laughs> continue. So, any are in more time. I can stop at the <coughs> as a senior advocate I will stop the second the bench agrees with me I will not argue beyond <laughs> so if you are agreeing with me I will stop immediately now uh, let's see article 13 it all began with article 13 laws inconsistent with or in derogation of the fundamental rights are void <coughs> very first judgment uh, that was uh, <coughs> um, Prasad versus Union of India, uh, 1951, SC 458. Say, uh, this covers only ordinary law, not constitution. Then, famous case of Sajjan Singh. They followed this. Sajjan Singh is 1965. But in Sajjan Singh, two judges expressed a doubt saying, no, no, Article 13 is not ordinary law only, it includes constitutional amendments also. But that was a dissenting judgment, fine. No, two years later, the constitution of the Supreme Court changed, not the constitution of India. This time, Golaknath said, it includes constitutional amendments also. Then what happened? Then the parliament revolted. Parliament said, that's wrong. And then they brought in all these. 
uh, the body. Now look at how clear when you are talking of intention of the legislature by the text of the uh, uh, constitution, all those things, it says uh, 13.4, nothing in this article shall apply to any amendment of this constitution made under 368. Very clear. Then 368 was amended. 368 originally talked of method of amendment. So there was a power to amend. So there was a debate whether it's procedural or substantive. Here they said it's procedure. So they amended 368 also and even that marginal note was changed. Power to amend the constitution and procedure thereof. Both power procedure covered. In spite of such clear indication of legislative intent, by how do they bring this basic structure? Uh, Glanville Austin says only two explanations. One is it's an act of statesmanship, not judicial interpretation, statesmanship. And then he uses another strange word. He said it is either an act of uh, statesmanship or legal domain. Legal domain is uh, something like a magic, you know, some craftiness, like that card trick, you suddenly get a card out of your hand. That's craftiness. Either this craftiness or statesmanship, not law. That is how we stand now. And with that, I will uh, conclude saying these are the principles and this is a historic decision which followed, which uh, ignored all these principles of interpretation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. The enlightenment we have today, the way you have Thank made interpretation of statutes and constitution with relevance. Uh, Any questions, please, I mean, one or two questions, anybody? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yes. Yeah, you take this one. No, you give it. no, no this one. Please. I am Vishwajit Bhattacharya, senior officer. Yes. Uh, you talked about Bangladesh constitution. Uh, Bangladesh was born in December 1971. So their constitution must have come well after that. Yes. Uh, and must be after 24th of April 1973 when Keshavananda Bharati Supreme Court judgment came. Yes. So therefore I think the Bangladesh constitution uh, took the concept of the basic structure from our Keshavananda Bharati and were wise enough to define. That's all I would like to say. Thank you. Uh, you have got a very, very interesting question. We got the concept of basic structure from Bangladesh, oh. not the other way around. See, I, this was pointed out to me by the Bangladesh judges. See, what happened is, in uh, I think 1964, uh, Bangladesh was not born. It was the Dhaka High Court of East Pakistan. Now. Bangladesh then, Pakistan, United Pakistan then had a republican constitution, presidential constitution. The president had executive powers, parliament was separate and there was a rule saying the president's council of advisors can have anybody other than parliament members. Because if you have parliament members that uh, separation of the executive and the legislature goes. The president had powers under removal of difficulties order under the Pakistan constitution. He used those powers and appointed three legislative assembly members as members of his council. That was challenged by our friends from Bangladesh, the Bengalis, they were not Bangladeshis then. They challenged it in the Dhaka High Court saying, this is contrary, you can't use a presidential order like this. Single judge of Dhaka High Court said it violates the basic structure of a presidential constitution. Affirmed by a division bench, taken on appeal to the Supreme Court of Pakistan, affirmed there. Supreme Court Pakistan judgment cited in Golaknath or Sajjan Singh. It was ignored. Sajjan Singh was 1965. Uh, so it Gulaknath must have been 1967. Uh, so in 67, it was cited, and we did not follow it because we went the other way. And then 
there was a german scholar also he had given a lecture these two things were taken in and made a part of the basic structure this is the first thing so in that sense as the bangladesh judges pointed out he said it's our high court uh, dhaka high court which gave this he he refused to give credit to the pakistan supreme court because pakistan was enemy he said dhaka high court did that then what happened is very recently about 1980 85 the supreme court of bangladesh followed keshavananda bharati so it came the whole circle and i told the bangladesh judges that you think you are very smart having this 7b in your constitution and 7a of the constitution says anybody who is amending this violating this is a person alleged to have committed the offence mentioned and shall be sentenced to the highest punishment prescribed for any offences or the existing law so it's almost treated like treason if you amend the basic structure if parliament of bangladesh amends 7b and other structures it's a treason i said look your judges six five judges up followed keshavan and the bharati and upheld these amendments i said seven judges all that it takes is seven judges to throw away basic structure if the parliament amends this that is taken to the bangladesh supreme court seven judges say it is okay then all these provisions go out of the window so all that i'm saying now is between us and liberty there are only 13 judges standing 14 judges can undo the whole thing so that's mm-hmm. something we have to think of and the second thing is we all say palki wala did a great thing he won the case the truth is he lost the case uh, keshavananda bharati was a very young monk his holiness was i think in his 30s or 40s at that suddenly he said why is my name coming in the papers every day i didn't do anything wrong and they said no 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 palki wala is arguing your case pro bono he has not taken even a rupee from you then at the end of it he said have you we have won the case kanga ji said am i getting my lands back he said no no you are not getting your lands back but you have won the case so that's another thing which you need to think thank you thank you very much yeah yeah please please you can you can take this uh sir uh, in light of uh, my name is kushbu lutra uh, in light of your book on gst law uh, i have read the book and i find it to be the most uh, progressive uh, commentary uh, and, uh, before that have you bought the book <laughs> yes sir uh, I, i have bought the book <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, my question is about uh, what are your views on the constitution uh, constitutionality of the gst council and the second question around the latest controversy and debate going on uh, on the uh, this uh, gaming uh, the uh, the levying of tax on the gaming uh, companies so uh, what are your views on that in the light of your talk today uh, it's, it's, uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I must first ask Sri 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 Guru Rao Guru whether this is out of syllabus or not. Can I answer? <laughs> you decide, yes, sir. <laughs> I will shortly give this to you. I mean, constitutionality of GST laws beyond because they have had a constitutional amendment to do that. On gaming, uh, um, I think the rules are ultra virus because the rules have gone beyond the section. Is my personal opinion, and I have covered it in a chapter in my book. the second thing is they are trying to get this retrospective i mean how can they get it resp- retrospective when they had no jurisdiction prior to the legislative competency was not there prior to the amendment so how can they do that so my question is yes there's a, a huge de- debate on that and very rightly so i i don't think the constitutionality of retrospectivity can stand and uh, i think they can get something but they want everything that is also wrong yeah you want to hurt quickly come one quickly aage aa jao aur aage so dinina uh, you uh, regard to your gobi manchurian topic sir yeah i think you are gobi manchurian and then interpreting uh, i mean uh, have interpreting the indian constitution by the western or foreign constitution so especially in uh, with regard to anil the concept of judicial review is not Uh, found in our constitution, yeah. but then our courts heavily yes. rely upon judicial review. That is an American concept which we have uh, borrowed. So, uh, do you think? How do you think? Sir? Because 
judicial review and certain other things we have already been uh, influenced or the courts have heavily borrowed it and have been using it in uh, almost every day. I mean, every day the courts have been using it. Sir. Uh, I, now, I differ slightly with what you are saying. Judicial review is not something we borrowed from the Americans. We borrowed from the British. And why is that? Because judicial review, in the sense of the court's power to strike down legislation, that was exercised very much by the federal court, which was a successor of the Supreme Court. So we got it from the Government of India Act. This is a, a purely a, a British concept. And this British concept, to the extent of subordinate legislation was always exercised by the High Court even before the 1935 Garden of India Act. Any subordinate legislation, ultra-virus was tested by the uh, High Court using the old writs of uh, w what was called the command writs of mandamus, etc. They did that. Now the same power which the High Courts exercised before has been incorporated into the Constitution of India. No new powers. So the same powers they inherited from the older high courts and the Supreme Court inherited it from the precedents of the federal court. So we don't have to go to America for that. Uh, I request uh, Vishwajit Patarya sir will give you a word of thanks. It's a <coughs> honor. Ram Krishna. We are indeed... Uh, on behalf of the Friday group, honored and uh, that uh, we have had a very scintillating talk on the interpretation of the Constitution by senior advocate and barrister Ramakrishnan Veda Raghavan. It was a great learning process for all of us. And uh, as, as the saying goes, an ideal student is a learner throughout his life. And at least uh, so we have learned. Uh, so, uh, and there is no end to learning. It is infinite. It is completely as deep as the ocean and as broad as the sky. Thank you very much and uh, uh, for having enriched the Friday group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Applause. Sir, we'll take your autograph. Then your message on next page.